Well, so I think big picture, it's it's very clear the Chinese Communist Party is going to make this very difficult to research and get data on. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. But I've seen over the years, uh, just so much has come out that what once was considered just this fringe conspiracy theory, yeah. now we have people in the House of Representatives talking about it seriously. Well, that's the astonishing thing, isn't it? This is the amazing uh, transformative change. And you see, what happened in Congress, in my view, did not start there. It started. Uh, now, I, I give huge credit to the who the man who brought us to the dance, which is Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. Okay, you know, all hail him because he he is the one who has really pushed this and made this happen to the point where you could actually pass the Stop Organ Harvesting Act of 2023, 2009, uh, uh, <laughs> 219 to 2 or whatever the vote was. It was the, and, and then the poor two people who, who didn't vote for it. Who is that sort of crazy lady? Um, Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green. Green. And, and the other guy from Kentucky, the libertarian guy, I uh, Steele or something. I forget. Uh, who he just that. votes forget against it. everything though, right? Well, so. okay, but he's a libertarian, you know, and I understand that, but that's kind of why I'm not a libertarian is, is you know, sort of him, <laughs> using him as an example. But leaving that aside, they got a lot of flack for that, which is great because when the Senate brings out its version of the bill, uh, people will be very afraid to vote for it. It's cancel culture. What do you want? You know, so there'll be, you know, people will fall into line. Vote against it, you mean? Vote against it. I'm sorry, to vote against it. And uh, most likely Biden will, <laughs> I don't imagine him vetoing it. Uh, so I think it's going to pass. And, and what will this bill do if it passes? Not that much. I mean, something. It will. What it basically does is it prevents uh, Chinese transplant surgeons from uh, from visiting the United States. That's key. Now you may say, "Well, so what?" Okay. Well, that's true. But for Chinese uh, surgeons, this is a very big deal, and this is a huge loss of face. Uh, and it also means they can't come to the conferences and so forth. Uh, medical conferences, they can't come to the universities, uh, they can't give uh, lectures, and they can't make deals on uh, medical equipment and so forth, uh, particularly robotics, which is uh, picking up right now in the transplant world. All of these issues uh, will come together on that, as well as the fact that uh, the bill sort of opens up a line of investigation on um, not exactly organ brokers, but on anybody who assists the Chinese organ harvesting juggernaut uh, will be, uh, can be exposed and rather publicly. And third, and I think this is the weakest part, is that supposedly it, it's going to authorize a, you know, a lot of research on this, a Manhattan Project of Research. I have not seen that yet. I, I am very interested in that, that research project and, and, and very interested in uh, the funding for that research project, but I haven't seen anybody sort of knocking at my door. Can you name any like prominent uh, organ harvesting researchers who you think should be getting this kind of funding? It's hard to come up with a name, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. There's only a handful of us. <laughs> there. I mean, I mean, you know, obviously there's, there's David Matus. Uh, there was David Kilgore until recently. Uh, obviously, uh, Jacob Levy and Matt Robertson. And uh, there's this guy, Ethan Gutman. And, uh, you know, there's a few we haven't seen a lot out of the journalist world, let's face it. Which is surprising. Sort of, strangely enough, they haven't jumped into this. I always talk to my son about that. I say, you know, son, you know, I was kind of hoping that you wouldn't go into law, but you'd, you know, go into the family business, the human rights. You know, in our own way, I think we've helped this community. And um, you know, <laughs> sort of the whole, <laughs> it's a wonderful life shtick. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the human rights industry is joyous and full of, you know, lots of fun opportunities, right? It's, 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 it's you know, it's a little too cushy sometimes as a lifestyle. Uh, but, okay, but the point is, well, let's leave the funding aside because maybe that's not the answer is government funding. The interesting thing here is that the basis of the whole thing, uh, the reason why that bill emerged in this year and, and uh, just a month and a half ago passed, uh, was really because of the ISHLT. Now, that is a, this is the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. 
Well, you can say, well, you know, okay, heart and lung transplant doctors are very powerful. Yeah, they're really powerful. They're, they make kidney, uh, uh, kidney and liver transplant doctors are a little bit lower on the, on the totem pole. <laughs> uh, this is just one of the natures, uh, one of the things I've discovered. They're a little bit like the Cubans in Central America or something. They're not small island boys. They have through partly through Jacob Levy, but not through him alone. They have for some time now been far more critical of the uh, Chinese uh, medical system or the Chinese transplant industry than their uh, friends at the uh, Transplantation Society, which supposedly represents all transplant doctors all over the world. Now, that's a long history, and I don't know if you want to go into that today, the ins and outs of that, but well, we could. But, well, I mean, but there's, the, there's certainly been what you're saying is there's there's been a lot of resistance over the last, I guess, two decades or decade and a half. Actually, let's go into the history for a second here, because stories are good and they're important. And I think uh, this isn't something that everybody knows. Look, in 2012, there was a, there had been enough noise made about the uh, uh, what the Chinese were doing in terms of forest organ harvesting that the, the uh, Transplantation Society, specifically Francis Del Monaco, the president of the Transplantation Society at that time, approached the Chinese very directly and said, we want you to reform. We hear these terrible things about you, organ harvesting from prisoners, all kinds of prisoners, all agog, and so forth. And uh, we're here to help you reform. We've done it in Africa. We've done it in other places. And we want to help you. Now, the Chinese made, I'm going to cut to the, make the story short here and say the Chinese basically made a deal. They said, yeah, we absolutely want to do that. We want to reform. But there are some bad people in China who do not want us to reform. There's some bad people in the party and the party is split. And you need to give us some, you need to give us plenty of, of uh, leash here. And you, you cannot embarrass anybody. So you just talk about prisoners. Do never talk about fallen God and never talk about Uyghurs or any, any other group or Christians or Tibetans, and just refer to prisoners. And by gum, after 2012, they had some negotiations back and forth. They visited China again and again. And by 2015, uh, the Chinese said, we are no longer harvesting prisoners starting this, uh, January 1st. You know, if now, I can interrupt for just yeah, a second, course, course, uh, yeah. that that reminds me a lot of, I believe, Matt, it was Alex Josky who came on the show and said that that was basically how China handled the U.S., went to prominent U.S. politicians and said, hey, you know, there are hardliners in the party. We want reforms, but there are hardliners. So if you come out and are aggressive, well, then that will just support them. And then exactly. it'll so just, just exactly. you know, go soft. Don't criticize China. And, you know, then, you know, us reformers will take over and everything it, will be fine. It's it's incredible that it works, but like also 2012 when this was all happening, it was the same year that that Xi Jinping promised uh, U.S. President Obama that China would not militarize the South China Sea, and we see how how well that went. Well, so, there's a lot of promises that year. That was a great year for promises. It was a great year for promises, As you know. And and the thing is, uh, but what makes this a little different than the case uh, that was just mentioned by Chris is. You know, most politicians in Washington have some sense that they don't really know China and that they kind of need help and they need a staff and, you know, they need sort of people to vet things. The, only the arrogance of somebody like Francis Delmonico would go into China with nothing, with no translator, no fixer, no nobody, okay? I used to work in China. I was one of those guys who would help companies set up a little team so they could do a negotiation in China. And, you know, you can say, well, you know, we we're kind of leeches on the business process, but we weren't. It was, it's legitimate. Why the hell would you come into China and just try to make a deal? These are the deal makers of the, the you know, of, of the centuries, as everybody says. They, they, they think in you know, hundreds of years, not, you know, in uh, hundreds of seconds like we do. I mean, <laughs> this is, you, you would be mad to do what they did. And you'd be mad to fall for the red carpet, and they did. They fell for every inch of this stuff. And the only reason that we eventually saw some pushback was because of a very heroic reporter named Didi Kirsten Tatlow, who worked for the New York Times. 
And Dee Dee Curzon Tatlow, I'd been in touch with her and talked to her about this issue, and she was already kind of investigating it. But she said one thing to me that was very interesting. This is on Signal. It was a secure line. She's in Beijing. On she said, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my kids. They're both in kindergarten in Beijing. And I said, oh, your kids will be fine. Nobody's going to take it out of them. Leave, they, the Chinese leave the Bambini out of this, if you're, if you're, at least if you're white, you know. <laughs> she said, okay, fair enough. She said, but Ethan, you know the kinds of stories I do. Will I still be able to do them? I said, no, you won't get the access. And she said, well, I'm going to have to think about this. Well, she thought about it. She talked to Jacob Levy, whose parents came out of the camps. They're the Holocaust survivors. And, and she wrote to him, and he leaked the email to me, and she said, I have no choice. I'm German. I, you're Jewish. I have to do this story. This is real. I know it's real. And she did do the story. And she got it into the New York Times in kind of a soft launch, just sort of saying there's an issue about this. But eventually she started writing harder stuff and sort of saying, why is the Vatican and uh, trying to make a deal with uh, Huang Jiefu, the master of ceremonies of transplantation in China. And she embarrassed the Chinese very much. And guess what? All her access was cut off and she was out of the New York Times six months later. Didn't she testify in the China Tribunal that uh, she did. there was some? Yes, she did testify, but she testified in the closed door session. She's mm. the only person who did that. I mean, there were witnesses there, you know, family over in China, but she did it in the closed door session, which indicates her somewhat bitterness. I mean, she called me up at one point and said, Ethan, I have a question for you. How do you make money, you know, doing human rights? And I said, listen, when I know the answer to that, I'll get back to you. I promise. I swear to God. I'm and I, I actually, I, I owe her a call because I now have some sense of how to make a little bit of money doing uh, human rights, or at least enough to make a living. But the point is, uh, she sacrificed herself, in a sense. She knew what she was doing. She's no dummy. And uh, in the process, she em embarrassed the Transplantation Society very much, because it was revealed that they're basically doing a semantic trick. They're pretending that no prisoners of conscience are being harvested. They're only, when they refer to prisoners, they're just referring to the prisoners people don't really care that much about, frankly, which is murderers and rapists. I mean, I'm sorry, nobody's really losing sleep over that issue. What we're losing sleep over is, you know, pregnant women being put under the knife, okay, uh, you know, who've done nothing. And, uh, you know, who've said Allah Akbar or something, you know, I mean, you know, or, or you know, Falun Gong is good. Uh -huh.